I've already released my RTX 2080 Super review, if you'd like to call it that. It's a faster 2080 and sells for around the same price. And while I have my issues with that card, the RTX 2070 Super is something different entirely and worth a dedicated video because there's important things to talk about. We have more competition in this space. The ironic thing is that because it's different, it actually becomes awfully similar to the original RTX 2080. So let's chat. If you're rocking the Windows 10 operating system and haven't activated your copy, click the link below and purchase an OEM license from SCD key. Then click here, 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 and then here. Paste your activation key and you'll have a fully activated OS in seconds. And be sure to use my offer code SStudio for an 18% discount on your order. So here's what I'm getting at. In a nutshell, the 2080 Super was a rehash 2080 with a few extra active SMs, actually only two extra. That's 128 more CUDA cores, 60 for per SM, and while I didn't explicitly mention it in that video, I have no doubt that this was released later as a result of a refined fabrication process. If yields are higher, you can afford to release a different SKU. My argument, however, was that this should have been refined from the start and not sold as a separate SKU a year later at the expense of early adopters for the same price. The Titan RTX was released only a couple of months after the 2080 Ti, both rocking the TU-102 die, mind you, but with the Titans fully unlocked 72 SMs and 4608 CUDA cores. If Nvidia could figure out how to refine that process from the start, why did it take them a year to boost yields for an inferior chip? Maybe they just had a preference. I don't know what was going on internally, but that's the question I have for them. I don't expect everyone to agree with that thinking, but the RTX 2070 Super boasts a total GPU upgrade from the TU-106 die to the TU-104 die, so it's a different approach to an upgrade. The same die both the RTX 2080 and RTX 2080 Super are using is now also in the RTX 2070 Super. How much more confusing can NVIDIA make this? So this results in a 256 CUDA core bump from the original 2070, a healthy boost in TDP, and a higher sustained base clock along with a higher sustained boost clock. The three cards I'd like you to focus on in these charts are the 2070, 2070 Super, and 2080 Super, since we expect the original 2080 to be phased out in time, and rightfully so, the 2080 Super retails for around the same price. The two 2070 variants sport custom Gigabyte boards that were sent to us for testing a few weeks ago and remain cool even under load. We should expect the same for an AIB 2080 Super, so this isn't necessarily apples to apples. As usual, sound intensity is a byproduct of thermals, so hotter cards should in theory run louder. You can find our test bench detailed in the video description. We've mentioned it several times these past few weeks, so I won't waste any time in this video. Performance bumps for the 2070 Super over the 2070 don't look all that appealing for some of our synthetic loads. Same can be said for the 2080 Super over the 2080, regardless of the resolution. But but venture into popular games and the cards begin to flex their muscles. The 2080 Super dominates the ring with a whole 8 FPS on average higher than the 2070 Super in GTA 5. In the DX12 API, the lead widens a bit up top while the 2070 Super struggles to distinguish itself from its non-Super counterpart in Ashes of the Singularity. Shadow of the Tomb Raider though, in the exact same API, DX12, the more powerful cards run a bit closer together and the 2070 Super pulls away quite handily from the 2070. And in Witcher 3, we see a nearly linear relationship between SKUs. A 10 FPS bump on average from the 2070 to the Super, another 10 from the Super to the 2080, and 7 from the 2080 to the other Super. In fact, most graphs on the internet look like this one. You'd be right to question any result that pitted the 2070 Super above the 2080, or say the 2070 you know, above the 2070 Super. Like This is just common sense, right? They kind of fall in place where you would expect them to. And this kind of stuff seems repetitive at this point, but I still see value in showing you the graphs, at least a few of them, to get the point across. The upgrades themselves aren't all that substantial, and I don't think Nvidia intended them to be. What I will say instead is this. My issues with the 2080 Super don't translate to my issues with the 2070 Super. In fact, since it's very likely the 2070 and 2070 Super will be sold simultaneously for a long time online and in big box stores, if anything, this is just a chance for the end user to be a bit more picky. You have a bit more choice, granted it's all from the same company, which is why regurgitating an internal competition is kind of 
it's just lackluster, I think. You may have noticed though, that I totally skipped over the 5700 and XT variants in this video. And that's because my conclusions about the 2070 and 2070 Super are being heavily influenced by these two cards and require a separate analysis. Let's look back at Shadow of the Tomb Raider, a DX12 title where, at least in our testing, the 5700 XT outperforms the 2070, but falls short of the Super by nine frames on average. The Super did really well here. And I'm not sure if that's just the die change or maybe the memory bandwidth or what, I, I don't know. But this is after three runs a piece. Actually, I think some of these were two runs a piece. If they're within like one or two FPS on average, we don't run it a third time. So right now you can buy the 5700 XT for 400 USD. Here's some pricing context, but it's a reference card that runs loud and hot. If we assume companies like PowerColor and XFX release AIB variants, which we know they are, we're getting a PowerColor sample here soon for a dedicated video, stay tuned for that. And we assume they're gonna mark up these cards just a bit because they have beefy coolers, let's say 450, but it runs quieter, it runs cooler, possibly overclocked, right? That's where the dilemma comes in because you can currently buy an RTX 2070 Duke from MSI for 449, just one card out of the many being offered. And you can grab 90 bucks worth of games in the process. This makes a decision a lot more difficult for the consumer, which I actually think is a good thing. You should struggle to choose a graphics card. That's how it's supposed to be. It means there's a healthy degree of competition in the graphics card market, something we've been missing in the mid to high end range for a long time, a long, long time. What was the, uh, I mean, the, the Radon 7, I mean, that thing was discontinued almost as quickly as it came to market. And apart from that, if you wanna go even more old school, we had the R9 Fury, Fury X, R9 Nano, those are some of the more powerful cards from a few generations ago. We haven't seen really anything like that on the high-end market from AMD since. And that's one of the reasons why I think I'm okay with the RTX 2070 Super launch, despite the weird shift in GPUs. It's just kind of a weird thing to do, but also retain the 70 naming scheme. Original 2070s were retailing at upwards of 500, 600 bucks at launch, right? Back in early, well, late 2018. But with the launch of the Super variant a few weeks ago, 2070 prices have dropped by a whole 100 bucks in some cases. It's pretty awesome. I, I loved the 1070. Pascal was awesome, right? Just straight up. I loved that card for 400 bucks. That gave us 90 Ti performance, a $600 value, and a lower TDP for a deep discount. We might not have the same value gains with Turing, due largely in part to Nvidia's leap in a ray tracing technology, but I'm not gonna complain about 2070 performance for the price of a 1070. And it's not as good of an upgrade as we saw the last generation leap, but it's still a good upgrade for the price. And that's practically where I'm getting at here. It took a while, but I feel a lot more comfortable with recommending a 2070 at this point. Probably not what you'd expect out of a 2070 Super review, but I'm always gonna be straight with you guys. If I was building a mid to high-end system for 1440p and light 4K gaming, the 2070 and 5700 XT would be the two cards in my sights, particularly AIB 5700 XTs for obvious reasons. So then what about the RTX 2060? You haven't even mentioned that card until now, Greg. What are you doing? Well, again, it's all about price for me, and I don't see the RTX 2060 falling in price to the extent I'm seeing the 2070 doing it. In fact, according to PC Part Picker Trends, the 2060 has gone up in price a bit following the 2060 Super's launch, which is a bit confusing to me, may have something to do with inventory levels, I'm not sure. I think the sweet spot for that card though is around 300 to 350 bucks, especially if you can already get a 2070 for a little over $400. So if you're seeing 2060s or even 2060 Supers for 400 plus USD, in my opinion, the 2070 is the better buy, assuming that card is not selling for upwards of $500. Prices are all over the place right now. I think it's because Nvidia is releasing so many different generations, well, not generations, so many different SKUs, kind of at the same time. They're offering tons of different cards, all in the mid to high range market, and it can be overwhelming for the consumer. One of the reasons why I wanted to give the 2070 Super a dedicated review because I think it actually sheds more light into how good a value the RTX 2070 non-Super has become as of late. But I've got to fall back on my quote from the last RTX video. If I had to choose between all of these cards for the best value of the bunch, I'll be honest, it isn't on this list. I still think it's the 1660 and TI models. I think those are the best value cards. We have dedicated videos coming out for those in a few weeks. I know we're late, but a lot's been happening here that uh, we haven't talked about yet. So we'll catch up on that stuff soon. But I will say though, the 2070 and 5700 XT look to be decent offerings right now from both green and red teams. And uh, I'd be content on really either for my next high-end 1440p gaming rig. I know there are some of you out there who are gonna straight up refuse to buy anything with an Nvidia label on it. And that's fine. I don't care, it doesn't affect 
me really at all. Uh, it's, it's actually why I encourage competition, right? And, and we're seeing the repercussions of that, at least in the mid-range graphics card market. But AMD still needs to get their act together in the high-end department. We desperately need something to compete with the 2080 and 2080 Ti. The fact that a 2080 Ti cost over a thousand dollars still in 2019 to me is a bit mind-boggling. I have a feeling we'll be waiting a while, by the way, for anything viable from the red team to come to market to compete with something that expensive from NVIDIA. That's all for this one. Thank you all for watching this far. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. I appreciate you to click that red subscribe button for more like this, and you can click that bell for redundancy's sake, because who knows what's going on with YouTube at any given moment. I'll catch you in the next one. This is Science Studio. Thanks for learning with us.